Well, we said we'd come right back, and we are back. And there is Odon are puffing away at his pipe as he is relaxing, lighting it up, and getting another good salient. Uh, what is it you have there? Rose tobacco that you're. I can smell it all the way over here. Oh, it smells good. No, it's a, it's a good a good blend, a French blend, Amphora. Amphora, mm. French blend. Listen, we give us a quick review of what you've just said. Let's go back and give it to you, Odan. You've done a great help. Thanks so much for coming on board. And thanks for redoing this one because we lost the f- first copy of this. It's much better now the second time around. Maybe we'll leave, lose this one and do a third time around to get it, embellish it even more. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, hello, hello, everyone. Um, what we saw in the, in the first part of the presentation was a bit like you, you just said, uh, Jay, the hard evidence we get from the 7th century, from the coins, from the inscriptions, contradicts the standard Islamic narrative. But moreover, it tells us another story. Something else happened. And um, we, we, we just saw that there were some very very difficult times and um, it, it all relates to the, um, the expectation that the Messiah will come, that the end of times is very near, the apocalypse is about to, to begin and the Messiah will establish God's kingdom on earth, God's kingdoms of, of justice. And um, I think the historical Muhammad, maybe Umar, if he existed, were uh, trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem in order to uh, have Jesus come back. But he did not come back. And the Arab rulers <clears throat> kept on expecting him to come back. But the, the further they, they waited, uh, and uh, the, the grander, the deception. The, um, Jesus did not come back, but since they had the power, they, they kind of uh, thought, hey, let's, um, let's make this kingdom of, of justice by ourselves. And we see this in the coins. In the coins, we see that the rulers... Um, pretended to rule at first in the name of God, then in the name of God, and also as intermediaries between God and man, which are um, very messianic uh, claims. We saw that uh, a a coin with uh, Muhammad on it, which cannot be an Islamic coin because it is a Christian coin. So maybe Muhammad was Jesus or was a messianic figure. And we saw with Abdallah in Al-Zubair something, I think, very important, maybe um, a tipping point in Islam's history, uh, one of many tipping points. <laughs> it is the first time that we see Muhammad Rasulullah written on something. It's the first time that we see it on a coin from 685, uh, non-Islamic coin, a coin from uh, from Persia, minted um, according to the Persian Empire pattern, minted by an Arab ruler who wrote Muhammad Rasulullah, and we saw that this phrase at this time during the seventh century cannot be understood as the Prophet Muhammad is God's apostle. Because we have nothing else to back this, to back this. There is nothing outside of this coin to explain us what Muhammad Rasulullah. Or is it? I think we have something outside of this coin to explain it. And uh, we went back to the Bible and we found that Muhammad Rasulullah in Aramaic is the very uh, acclamation that was used when Jesus. Um, when Jesus entered Jerusalem and that and here the, the Jewish crowd shouted, um, blessed is he we send by God. 
And in Aramaic, it is almost the same as Muhammad Rasulullah, which means that Abdallah ibn al-Zubair, when he wrote it, when he wrote Muhammad Rasulullah on his coins, he kind of identified himself with Jesus and he, he claimed to be um, the new Muhammad, the new Jesus. And he came to be God's apostle himself. And he was to uh, establish God's kingdom. And it was this claim that, that fueled his, um, his claim to, to power. He opposed at the time the Umayyad power, the Umayyad power in Damas, in Syria. And uh, he waged war against the Umayyads and he lost. He lost to Abdul Malik. And what Abdul Malik did was um, at first having him defeated, having him crucify, crucified and so on. And also what he did was to, to gather, uh, he tried to gather every coin of Abdallah ibn al-Zubair, mentioning Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, and he had them melted to make his own coins. And also to try to erase Abdallah ibn al-Zubair's memory. But what we see is that here, with one of the first coins that Abdul Malik minted, he, he took for himself the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah. You see, instead of inventing something new, and I think this is Abdul Malik genius here, he took everything from himself for, for himself. He claimed to be the Muhammad instead of Abdallah ibn al -Zubair. He claimed to be the Rasulullah, the one sent by God, instead of Abdallah ibn al -Zubair, because he defeated him. And he took for himself also to be the servant of God, the commander of the believers, and he took the Bismillah for him also, as we see here on this false, that was this uh, Umayyad false, this copper coin, which was minted uh, by Abdul Malik between 690 and 696. We see use the Bismillah again in the name of God here, there is no God but God, um, God alone. And may the one said, my God, be desired. And on the obverse here, um, we see Abdul Malik himself, the standing caliph, with the hand on his sword, his sheath sword, about to unsheath his sword and to, to wage war and uh, claiming to be the servant of God and the commander of the believers. What we can get also from this uh, coin is that it is still uh, a Byzantine Empire pattern coin. There is no more Christian symbols, no more crosses, no more emperor figure. The emperor figure has been replaced by Abdul Malik himself. So it is a, a very aggressive statement against the Byzantine Empire. And um, we see that here we have something very strange. Instead of the traditional uh, Byzantine cross, we have a pole, uh, a staff with a sort of round thing around it. We don't know for sure what it is. Is it the black stone? Is it something? We don't know. We don't know, but for sure it is not a Christian cross. And again, when you put all this together, it is a very aggressive posture, a very aggressive statement against the Byzantine Empire. We but saw I, that... Uh, may I just interrupt uh, that obverse symbol that you're just talking about? Is it not a mockery of the cross itself? Because it has the pedestals as if it's the Byzantine cross, mm -hmm. but it has the circle replacing the cross itself. Would that be a kind of a mockery against... Justinian the second. I think so. I, I was about to, to <coughs> make a sort of a relation between this coin and the one Muawiyah uh, minted. You remember the gold coin that we are, Muawiyah minted at the end of his reign to pay tribute to the Byzantine Empire. 
And Muawiyah started the mockery. <laughs> okay. He started to, to mock the Christian symbols and he, he retrieved the cross and replaced it with something else, a staff and a bar. And here, the interesting point here is maybe the evolution between um, Muawiyah's coin. Let me just uh, show it to you. Muawiyah's coin here with the staff and something that is not a cross. And with Abdul Malik, we have something in the shape of um, a sphere. And in other coins, in, in um, later coins from uh, Abdul Malik, we will see also this sphere. Uh, here it's very, very crude, it's a sort of symbol. And one hypothesis would be that this could be a depiction of the black stone. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe just a mockery. Okay. But it worked very well as a mockery because the Byzantine emperor um, at the time um, started to, to, to realize that uh, Abdul Malik was uh, an opponent and a strong one. And this will be even more uh, clear, clearer with uh, Abdul Malik's uh, inscriptions and other co uh, later coins. Here, um, I want to have a look at um, some of the inscriptions on copper plaques on the Dome of the Rock, which are attributed the inscriptions to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik built the Dome of the Rock around the year 692. We don't know for sure whether it's the starting of the building or the end of the building, 692. But um, the Dome of the Rock is something very particular. At the time, there was, instead of the Dome of the Rock, on the, on the Temple Mount, there was um, a very crudely built temple um, that one Frankish um, bishop who did a pilgrimage in Jerusalem and in all of the Holy Land. So, and he described in 670 um, a large house made with beams, large beams, a quadrangular house, which could um, house uh, thousands of um, worshippers. So there was a construction here. It was the third temple built here on the Temple Mount. And when Abdul Malik decided to destroy it, to have it erased and to build something else, um, it was a statement in itself, a statement about Abdul Malik being in, now in charge, having control over Jerusalem and so having control over the Christians and the Jews. And this is written in the inscriptions. And there is something else. The Temple Mount and the Jerusalem um, place was supposed to be in the very early 7th century and the very early Islamic tradition, the place of the apocalypse, the place where Jesus was to, to come back, where the nation uh, were to be gathered in the Kidron Valley, so uh, just outside of the temple and uh, the, the judgment day, um, the judgment of the nation should have happened there. When Abdul Malik built its dome here, he said to the world, there will be no apocalypse. Jesus will not come back. There is nothing about the return of Jesus in the Dome of the Rock inscriptions. So he tells us that um, the waiting for the Messiah is over. Something else is happening. Uh, he, Abdul Malik, takes charge and um, he, he, he will begin the, um, the Messianic times. This is a very, very strong uh, symbol and statement that we can get from the, the, the very building of the Dome of the Rock. 
but from his from its inscriptions, especially those in the inside of the Dome of the Rock, which uh, dates from the Abdul Malik from the seventh century, we can get some information about what Muhammad meant exactly. And this is very, very interesting. Here on this, uh, on this plaque, um, I have just um, written here on an except, it's not the whole, um, the whole writing. We can read, we ask you, O oh God, to bless the Muhammad, your servant, your prophet, or your envoy, exactly, and to accept his intercession with you for his people. So who is this Muhammad here? Is he the prophet of Islam? Or is he, I think, Abdul Malik himself? You see that Muhammad is the servant of God. This is exactly what Abdul Malik wrote on his own coins. I am the servant of God and the commander of the, uh, the believers. We see also that Abdul Malik, I think, wrote that he was himself God's envoy, God's prophet, sort of. Here, the translation is not very good because it's Rasul. Rasul is sent, the one who is sent, not prophet per se. Per prophet in Arabic is Nabi. Nabi, it's another word. And here also, we see that the Muhammad, which is described here, is well and alive at the time because the, the people, uh, uh, um, the, the one who read, um, can, can understand that he is interceding um, to God uh, with um, interceding to God for his people. So it means that he is alive. The prophet of Islam, according to the standard Islamic narrative, died in 632. How could a dead man intercede uh, to God? How could he have an intercession? with God. Mm -hmm. In, in the um, standard Islamic narrative, in, the, in Islam theology, when you're dead, you're supposed to be either in hell or in paradise. And there you don't have any contacts with God. You cannot have an intercession with him. The only intercession we know of is the intercession of living people who pray to God. And this is what is described here. So it means that the Muhammad that is described is um, a living man who claims to be the servant of God and the envoy of God. I think it is Abdul Malik who is described here. And we can see this also in another inscription in the Dome of the Rock, another copper plaque. Here it is the one at the northern entrance inside of the Dome of the Rock which says Muhammad is the servant of God and his messenger, whom he sent with the guidance and the religion of truth, that he may make it conqueror of all religion. And we saw in the previous presentation that the word Muhammad was not to be underst understood at the time as a name, but as a participle. So the right translation maybe is here, may the servant of God, or other, may the servant of God and his envoy be desired, be worshipped, whom he sent with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it conqueror of all religion. And I think again that it relates to Abdul Malik. He is the one who claims to be the conqueror of all religion. This is what the Dome of the Rock is about. I am uh, in charge. I am the new boss, the boss of Christians, the boss of Jews. I am the conqueror of all religion. When you put together all those inscriptions, you get the picture of what Abdul Malik pretended to be. He pretended to be the coveted one, the desired one, the worshipped one, the servant of God, the one who interceded to God, with God, as being an intermediary between God and man, uh, a servant of God, a commander of the believers, 
And he had a mission. God sent him with the mission of conquering all of religion. So we see here that Abdul Malik is not any Arab ruler. There is something very, um, very new <coughs> and very big <coughs> with Abdul Malik. We see here that um, Byzantine emperor uh, might have been uh, right to, to fear him. And um, he will he will be making uh, aggressive statements um, to, to the Byzantine emperor. Here we have another de-Christianized and mockery coin minted by Abdul Malik in 692, the very year of the building of the Dome of the Rock. It's kind of the same uh, coin that the one um, Muawiyah minted um, in 678. It is a copy of um, a Byzantine gold coin that was minted to pay tribute to the Byzantine Empire, uh, Empire and Emperor. And um, the mockery here was too big. To, it was too big a mockery to, 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 for, for the Byzantine Empire, Emperor to, to let go. Slightly. He could not dismiss it. He had to react. He could to not it. dismiss, yeah. exactly. And uh, this led to a war. The Byzantine Emperor refused this coinage and uh, engaged in a war with Abdul Malik, and he lost. Um, this was uh, all the more a mockery that uh, Abdul Malik here uh, on the reverse of the coin still uh, retrieved the cross and replaced it with a staff and a sphere. But he also wrote, in the name of God, there is no God but one God, so no Jesus. May the one sent by God be desired. I am the one sent by God. So this is um, not only an aggressive statement, but also um, a sort of, um, there is a continuity with the um, copper plaque in inscription we saw. Abdul Malik here claims to be the conqueror of all religion. And with him sending those coins to the Byzantine Empire, um, Emperor, he tells him that he will conquer his religion, hence he will conquer his empire. We have uh, also um, another thing to, to, to bear in mind is the, it is that the, the uh, Byzantine Empire at this time in 692 uh, changed. A new uh, emperor um, came to the throne, Justinian II, and we will see that um, uh, he he had different views about uh, Christianity, about his own religion, than his predecessor, and that might have been um, a reason why he, he came to war, he waged war um, to Abdul Malik. We will see this here, exactly. Here it's another um, coin minted by Abdul Malik. We have on the obverse, uh, the reverse, excuse me, here, uh, almost the same uh, image and, um, than the, um, the previous coin. We have see, it is still an, Im an imitation of the Byzantine uh, Empire pattern, but still no cross, and instead a staff with a sphere here. And we have also on the obverse the inscription Bismillah, Bismillah, La ilaha illallah. Wardu Muhammad Rasulullah. In the name of God, there is no God but one God. May the one sent by God be worshipped, desired. You could also translate, may the one sent by God be desired, as um, a very assertive phrase, such as, worship the one sent by God. I command you to worship the one sent by God. I command you to worship me the standing caliph with the hand on the sword. Otherwise, I will unsheath the sword and you will see what happened. 
Still, what we see here, and this is uh, something to 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 under underline. Um, this is still a Byzantine Empire pattern, even though there are no more Christian symbols. And the Byzantine Empire figure has been replaced by Abdul Malik. And um, I told you that uh, things might have changed with the, um, the coming to power of Justinian II. He came to power in 692. And um, I think his predecessors, uh, at least the three up until um, the uh, three previous emperors before Justinian II um, had not the same um, orthodox view on religion as Justinian II. His predecessor uh, were, um, they had a, a sort of soft touch for the monophysites. So the one who believed that Jesus was not the son of God or that he was not part of the Holy Trinity. And this could explain, help to explain the um, good relationships between the first Arab rulers and the Byzantine Empire. But with Justinian II, we have a very orthodox uh, emperor who wants to enforce a very orthodox vision of Christianity and he tells the Byzantine world so by minting this uh, solidus, uh, this gold um, coin here. <clears throat> you might see here that uh, we have a standing uh, emperor figure with a cross in his hand, which is a um, traditional uh, Byzantine Empire pattern. But on the reverse of the obverse, excuse me, on the obverse of the, of the coin, um, we have the figure of a Christ Pantocrator, a Christ Almighty, which, uh, which is in direct opposition to what Abdul Malik pretends to be. And so here we have the clash. There is a clash between the new ruler, the new Arab, Arab ruler, and um, and the, um, the Byzantine emperor. So the, the, there was a war, as we just um, as we just uh, told, and the Byzantine emperor lost, which um, which led Abdul Malik to be the unchallenged ruler of the Middle East. And here we have something very, very new, because by defeating the Byzantine Empire, um, he was able to um, to start a new, to, to build his own empire. And this is what the, his next coin will, will show us. <clears throat> the next coins, and um, you will see that those are, are coins um, that are minted within a year or two of each other. So things are evolving very, very fast. In 692, we, he was building the Dome of the Rock, writing these inscriptions, minting his first coins. The former coin was for, from 694. And here we have a coin from this year, 694, 695, which is very, very interesting. It is still a sort of um, Persian Empire pattern coin. We still have the Zoroastrian symbolism, but we have something uh, here. We have the Muhammad Rasulullah phrase, may the one sent by God be desired in the name of God also. But here we have also the Amir al-Muminin, I am the commander of the believers. And here we have something new, something new and something very interesting uh, here, Abdul Malik, which is depicted here with the as a standing caliph figure and the hand of his uh, on, on with the hand uh, on the on his sword. Here, Abdul Malik says, "I am Khalifat Allah," which means Lieutenant of God. I am the Caliph of God. This is the first time we see the word Caliph on a coin. 
And what, what does it mean to be Khalifat Allah, Lieutenant of God? It means that um, his power is divine and his new empire is the, um, the new kingdom of God. He rules in the name of God, but moreover, what he, what he does the, 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 the territory um, on, on which his rule applies is the territory where God's law is um, abided by. So, by claiming he is Khalifat Allah, God's caliph, he creates the caliphate. The caliphate being God's kingdom on earth. So this is something new. We did not find this on the previous coins from Muawiyah, from uh, uh, Abdallah ibn al-Zubair, and even less in the, in the very early coins that we, that we saw. This is something very, very, very new. We can also um, gather something from the juxtaposition, the of the, the Persian emperor figure here, traditional Persian emperor figure uh, with the likes of uh, Khosrow II on one side of the coin and on the other side, the, the, the real ruler. We have here the, the caliph himself with the hand on his, on, on his sword. Here, this is something very symbolic. This is the power of ancient Persia. Here we have the new ruler, the new, the new boss in town. We have another coin almost, <coughs> almost during the, the, the same time, which is even more interesting. It is still a um, Persian Empire pattern with Zoroastrian symbolism. There is the Arabic phrase Bismillah, Bismillah la ilaha illallah, wa ahdu Muhammad, Muhammad Rasulullah, the same as before. In the name of God, there is no God but God, unique. May the one sent by God be desired. But here, uh, in here, we also find the same phrases as before: Amir al muminin Commander of the Believer, Khalifa Allah, Lieutenant of God. And uh, at the center here, we do not have the standing caliph figure. We might see him here instead, in the place of the traditional uh, Persian emperor figure. Because look at this here. We see that he is holding his sword. He, ha he has his hands on his sword, ready to unsheath his sword, a bit like um, the standing caliph figure. So it might be Abdul Malik himself here and not the, um, the effigy of uh, Khosrow the, the second. And here in the middle, we have something a bit odd. It's a sort of an, an arch with um, a lens. Uh, see here the shaft, the end of the a spear, a spear, not a lens, a spear. So another symbol of uh, power another very aggressive symbol. And we have a unique expression here, Nasrallah, God's help, which reminds us of the Quran itself. In the Quran, there is uh, this surah, a very short surah, surah 110, about Nasrallah, God's help. When God's help comes and the victory, and you see the people entering into the religion of God in crowds, glorify your Lord with praise and ask for forgiveness from him. Surely he turns in forgiveness. This is one of the very last surahs, a very apocalyptic surah. It tells us about the end of time. The end of time will be when God's help have come. And the victory will be here for God's religion. This is what Abdul Malik claims. I am God's help. I am myself God's help. By creating the caliphate, God's, um, the victory um, has been achieved. We are victorious. 
and uh, let, let, let's begin a new era. Um, so in a sense, the end of times have come. The apocalypse is now, but it's not an apocalypse of destruction. It's an apocalypse of building a new kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. And this is what Abdul Malik pretends. So um, something very, very strong here. And we see that it is not only in the East that Abdul Malik pretends to be Khalif Atala, but also in the West, as we find numerous coins, other coins in the West with the Byzantine Empire pattern, also claiming that he is Amir al muminin commander of the believer, and Khalif Atala. I have found some, uh, but I, I'm sure there are many, many, many others. And then came the, um, the reform, re not the reformation or reform, the coinage reform of the great coinage reform of Abdul Malik, which is a sort of um, continuation of what he did with his empire patterns coins. He is starting something new, a new empire with an, an original empire. So he needs a new coinage, new symbolic for his power. He cannot rely, he cannot uh, keep on using the Byzantine Empire patterns and the, Byzant the Persian Empire patterns. So he creates something new with those coins that uh, these coins in particular was minted in between 697-698. And uh, this is a very um, political and religious coin at the same time. In the, in the center of the obverse, we see La Hila Illa, no divinity other than Allah Wahadu, Wahdaou, uh, God unique. La Sharik Laou, he has no partner, which is a um, direct uh, attack towards um, the, the Christian faith, toward the, the Trinity. Um, in the margin, may the messenger of God be worshipped, be desired who sent him with guidance and the religion of truth so that it may triumph over all other religions, which is almost the exact, exact same phrase as the one we saw uh, in the Dome of the Rock inscriptions on the copper plates. <coughs> it is also something that we will find in the Quranic text in Surah 9. On the reverse side, at the center, God is one, God is eternal. He has not begotten, nor was it begotten, which is, again, an attack on the Christian face uh, in the Holy Trinity. And uh, some technical information uh, about the coin, because uh, um, a coin has also to be useful uh, with um, a date and a value. In the name of God, this dinar was minted in the year 78. So here we have um, a new original pattern for a new original empire. This is the very symbolic of the, this coin. We have, uh, we see that Abdul Malik got rid of the Byzantine and Persian patterns and that, that he is now using Islamic or pre-Islamic, because is it Islam yet, uh, symbols? I don't think this is Islam yet, because I think the one who, 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 the one who is described as being the Muhammad is not the prophet Muhammad, but Abdul Malik himself. You see, this is because this makes sense with all the evidence we just saw with the Dome of the Rock, with the other coins, so I think there is no Prophet Muhammad yet, but only a very powerful figure, the new Caliph and his new empire. And we can also get it from inscriptions. This is one of the very first, I think maybe the first epigraphic inscription to mention Muhammad. Uh, maybe there is a tombstone in Egypt also. Um, but as an epigraphic inscription, 
it is almost the very first one. This was at the time when I um, discovered it. Oh, I was not the one who discovered the inscription in the, uh, on the Isma Plateau, uh, 200 kilometers from Petra. It is a, a team of um, Muslim uh, researchers, uh, modern days, uh, Indiana Jones, sort of, mm. who, were looking, who are looking for those kind of inscription. And they found this one, which is almost the, the same as the Dome of the Rock uh, inscription. Oh God, bless the Muhammad and accept his intercession in his community. And have mercy on us and after. And we can get uh, a date because there is a signature. Bakr bin Abi Bakr al-Aslami wrote at the end of the year 80, which means that this inscription can be dated between 699 and 700. So under the rule of Abdul Malik, and here again, we see that the Muhammad is someone who is interceding with God. So he is um, alive and well. He is a living person. He's not a dead prophet uh, from 70 years ago. He cannot be. It must be a living person. So I think it, this relates to, um, again, to Abdul Malik being the Muhammad, being the one who is to be desired, who is to be worshipped. And so here we have something very um, interesting to put in our, in our graph. Um, Abdul Malik takes for himself all the claims um, that his predecessor made to power in the name of God, intermediary between God, of, God and man as being servant of God and commander of the believers. He identified himself with the Messiah as a Muhammad and as God's envoy or apostle. But he had something new. He is the caliph of God. And we will see that his successors will, um, will uh, keep on this title, will keep on being caliphs of God, uh, ruling over the caliphate, ruling over God's new kingdom on earth, God's new kingdom of justice. But here we have opened a new era and we will see no more coins with Christian and Zoroastrian symbolics and uh, empire patterns, former empire patterns. We will only have coins with inscriptions such as the, um, the one we just saw with pre-Islamic or Islamic symbolism. But it does not mean that the um, standing caliph legacy um, has, has, um, has disappeared. We do not see coins with the standing caliphs, caliph on it, with the hand on his, uh, on his sword, but we see uh, other depiction of the standing caliph uh, figure, for example, with this statue, um, which dates from 740, 750. Um, Meld already show, showed it on, um, on, on, your, um, on your channel, Jay. Yeah. And I think I was the one to, I was the one who sent the, the photo to him. <laughs> but I don't know whether I got it from me or, or somebody else. Thank or you. For from, Thank you. Um, and so this is a statue of, um, we think, the caliph, the caliph, the caliph Walid II, uh, one of the last Umayyads before the, the Abbasid revolution, before the, the war between uh, the Umayyads and the Abbasids. This is a statue that has been found in one of his palaces. It might have been sculpted uh, a bit before, but uh, we can say for sure that he had this statue in his palace, either to remember that he was Abdul Malik's successor, the standing caliph successor, but also to tell the world or to tell the people that were coming in his palace that he himself was a kind of, um, he was like the Sanding Caliph, he was the Sanding Caliph, and he also uh, had Abdul Malik powers. Um, yes, so it's reminiscent of the Abdul Malik coins. 
And just uh, as an element of context, this is um, a coin which was minted by Walid II. We see here that we are um, in the um, in the Abdul Malik reform uh, coinage reformations pattern. The Arabic script has a bit changed. It's more of a Kufic script now. Um, on the Abdul Malik's coin, it was much more of a Hijazi script. Hijazi script meaning a northern uh, script. It's not a script from the Hijaz. Um, but it's almost uh, exactly the same, um, the same phrases and the same, uh, the same inscription. So, with uh, Abdul Malik's successors, <coughs> they were successors of Abdul Malik, meaning successors of the Mu of the Muhammad, and they claim their power from um, Abdul Malik's claim uh, itself. Um, and they, they added a layer of claim, another one. They ruled as caliphs of God and as Abdul Malik's successors. So one could ask now what, what happened when the Umayyads, when the successor of Abdul Malik, um, lost the war against the Abbasid, and how did the Abbasid justified their power at the time, because they themselves, the Abbasids, they, they wanted to be God's caliph. They wanted to rule over the caliphate, the caliphate. But they could not claim to be the successors of Muhammad, of the Muhammad, the successor of Abdul Malik. They needed another justification for their claim. And what we saw, with, what we see with the Abbasid is that they used the phrase Khalifat Rasul Allah instead of Khalifat Allah. So they, they add another layer of justification. They claim to, to get the power from the Prophet Muhammad himself. And this is something very understandable. They conquered God's kingdom on earth, but they could not claim, uh, they could not justify their, their powers by the, fun, the very founder of God's kingdom on earth. So they had to invent um, a divine, a, di a direct divine justification which means that someone in the past must have given a sort of revelation that the caliphs were the ones to rule over God's kingdom on earth. So this is the invention of Muhammad's prophetism, Muhammad's revelation, and the replacement of the claim of caliph of God and successor of Abdel Malik, by another claim, we are successor of the Prophet Muhammad. And this is also the replacement of the identification with the Messiah as the Muhammad and as God envoy with another claim, Muhammad is sent from God. And so the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah now gets a new meaning, it does not mean may the one sent by God be worshipped or desired. The Abbasid will impose a new narrative. They will impose Muhammad as a name and not as a participle. And so the phrase, the meaning of the phrase changes, drifts, and become Muhammad is sent from God. God has sent Muhammad. Muhammad Rasulullah becomes the um, Islamic uh, part of the Islamic Shahada. And this is from there that the um, standard Islamic narrative uh, is created, uh, is um, tested, and uh, it will take centuries up until the 9th, the 10th, and even after, it will take centuries to form a narrative that is coherent, 
that um, is kind of logical. It's not that logical, but uh, it has its own logic. And um, <clears throat> that justifies the, um, the power of the Abbasids. And here we have also <clears throat> I have something to, to add about the um, Ali and the Alids, the partisan of Ali, who became the Shiite, the Shiite, um, the Shiites. <clears throat> when the um, Abbasid fought the Umayyads, they formed a sort of a coalition made of uh, Arabs, uh, led by the Abbasids, made of Persians also especially the Persians that were not within uh, Abdul Malik's empire, and made of Alids, Shiites. That were, they were not Shiites at the time. But in 750, when the Abbasid coalition won, part of this coalition was made of Alids, which means that the Alids and the Abbasid ruled together the caliphate, which means that the Shiite standard <laughs> uh, narrative was not created until the, um, the end of this coalition in the 10th or 11th uh, century. And this is something very, uh, very interesting because because um, every scholar, every historian knows that the Alids were part of the Abbasid coalition, but they do, do not um, draw conclusion from this. The conclusion that there was no real difference between Sunnis and Shiites up until the 10th and 11th century, which explains why the Shiites and the Sunnis have a large uh, common core of um, traditions and why they share the same Quranic text. It's because, uh, it's because it was made by both of them. I think the Shiites were kind of um, an inside movement in the Abbasid administration the Arabs, the Abbasid um, took charge of the military, the administration, and, and so on. And the Shiite took, um, took charge of the religious aspects of the, um, of the construction. When I say Shiite here, um, um, beware, it was not all of the Shiites, not all of the Alids, all, because some Alids did not uh, take part in the Abbasid coalition. And they formed the, um, the Seveners movement, the one that uh, created thereafter the Fatimid uh, Caliphate in Egypt. So it was, uh, it was not all of the Alids that were in the um, Abbasid coalition. And here we have, uh, with this graph, I think, um, an explanation of the, the process that created Islam, the very long political, theological, and religious process that created Islam. We see how layers after layers, the Arab leaders uh, built Islam, Islam by claiming messianic powers up until there was uh, a ruler that was stronger, that really, really stronger than the others, Abdul Malik, who claimed to be the Messiah himself, and to uh, establish God's kingdom instead of the Messiah. And thereafter, with the Abbasids, there was um, the memories were erased. You see, with Abdul Malik, we have something new, but it still relates to the Jewish and Christian expectations of the seventh century. It still relates to the expectation that the Messiah will come and he will establish. God's justice, God's kingdom on earth. With the Abbasid, there is no more Jewish and Christian um, um, remnants in the religion. It's all new, but it's all based on those former expectations. 
this is what I uh, have here in my uh, conclusion. Um, as we just saw, Islam emerged from a long political and religious process, a process that is deeply rooted in some Jewish and especially Nazarene Jewish, Judeo Nazarene, and ex Christian apocalyptical expectations. There was a plan to trigger the end of times to have Jesus come back and have him establish God's political reign on earth, the Amr Allah. But the plan failed and Jesus did not come back and the Arab rulers kept on waiting on his return as they gradually took on his clothes, his Messiah's clothes, to inaugurate the new messianic times. By claiming to establish God's political reign on earth, they in fact no longer needed Jesus to come back and they found other justification for their power by inventing the Islamic revelation and thus the prophetism of Muhammad. And so the caliph, starting from Abd al-Malik, slowly replaced Jesus. The figure of the eschatological Jesus, the Jesus of the end of time, has thus been postponed by the Islamic narrative to another end of times. It could not be completely removed because of the socio-cultural collective memory, confers the eschatological tradition, which shall transmit the former expectation of Jesus' imminent descent in the 7th century, the very tradition that are in some hadith. And furthermore, we Mm, Jesus is still useful for the standard Islamic narrative because Jesus' return has been used as a sort of uh, reinforcement of Islam's main hope and goal. Should the Muslims fail to establish God's political reign on earth by themselves, they can rest assured they will achieve it anyway at the end of times when Jesus himself will, will come back will take command of the Muslim armies with the Mahdi, will conquer the world, slay the Antichrist, the Al-Masih at Dajjal, and be the judges of all mankind. And so one could say that deep inside, Muhammad's religion, Islam, is actually and still Jesus' religion. Okay, thanks so much. Well, listen, <laughs> you've you've uh, actually taken off an awful lot. You've uh, put an, an enormous amount of material into these episodes. The first one that we did uh, from around six forty up to six eighty five um, uh, with the coins. This I've asked you to do the coins, uh, ending with Zubair bringing in the name Muhammad, and then. This episode, where you then start with Abdul Malik in 692, 693, going up to 696, and then moving on up when uh, to the statue mm -hmm. and down up to the Abbasids. And I thought it's interesting what you have done. You have kind of shown by looking at the coins that if you follow on, uh, if you look, just look at the coins without putting any overlay or trying to interpret the coins, just looking and seeing what the coins say. It's very clear uh, that they're, first of all, they're not Islamic and that there's nothing Islamic about them. Uh, they're very they, they really do reflect the powers that be that still control them. And the powers that be in the West would be the Byzantine. So they tend to be Christian in nature. And the powers that be over here are still, though, though the Sassanids are no longer in power, like the Byzantines are over here, it's still that memory, uh, that Zoroastrian memory. And of course, it's still giving lip service to that memory. And so you have the Zoroastrian coins with the, uh, uh, with, with, uh, the, uh, the fire altars. Mm -hmm. And then as you get to, to the, this episode, we're now moving into Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is very important. He lives up there in Damascus. He's way up here in Syria, right next to the Byzantines. I mean, the Byzantine Empire is just above him. If you look on a map, I'll show you the map right here. Look how close mm -hmm. it is. So he, his biggest concern is the Byzantines. Politically speaking, they're his biggest concern, and also theologically speaking. And so it stands to reason that he doesn't want to continue to pay tribute. They've been paying train tribute now for 30 years since the time of Mu'awiyah, and he's fed up with this. And so he then introduces that very damaging coin that's very similar to the one Justinian, sorry, the one that Mu'awiyah had, had introduced mm -hmm. earlier, 30 years earlier. And he introduces this coin, 
which is a mockery of the Byzantines. It no longer has the, the, the crosses on it. And it introduces this phrase, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the shahada. This is the shahada that we know today. What's fascinating is we today, the way we look at the shahada today, that we have interpreted it as the way the Muslims have told us to interpret it, because today's reference is Muhammad, the prophet of God, or the, 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 uh, the helper of God. But Muhammad is the person name. That's how everybody interprets that. And that's been the big problem that all these numismatists have had looking at that coin. You're saying, hold on, mm-hmm. hold on. No, no, no. The name Muhammad is if you need to put it in the context of the seventh century and you need to put it in that context, it's very clear that this is the praised one, but what? Or the, uh, the beloved of Allah. This is the beloved of God. And of course, this could be Abdul Malik himself. He is the beloved of God. Because now that, and, and I love what you've done. You've taken and you've shown what was happening, not only religiously, but politically. These Arabs were, now that they were now, they had been thrown off the mantle of the Sassanids and the Persians have been thrown off the back. They now were mm-hmm. in charge. And though they were vassal states of the Byzantines in the West and still have that memory in the East of the Zoroastrians, they were waiting for Jesus' return. He didn't return. So what do they do? Well, as you interpret it, they start saying, well, let me take that that place. Let me start. Since Jesus is not here to fulfill his return, I'm going to be take on that messianic figure. And that's why then they refer to themselves as the blessed one. Zubair mm-hmm. does that on his coins pro- there in in Iraq. And now Abdul does that. Abdul Malik does that there in Syria on his coin with the one that really mocks. I'm now the blessed one of God. You're no longer the blessed one of God. I'm the blessed one of God. This is a mockery against you. He mocks Jesus, the back, right? Yeah, go ahead. You, you, you saw um, the, the coin of Justinian II who put the, the Christ, Pantocrato, on his coin. And you, you saw what Abdul Malik made in his place. The, the Muhammad was the Christ Pantocrator for Justinian II. Yeah. And he, Abdul Malik, was the Muhammad in his new, in his new kingdom. Okay. And so there's the mockery and it's the, 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 the comeback to what Justinian II, who also came to power. Uh, well, he came to power in 692. Muhammad, I mean, Abdul Malik had been in power since 685. So he had already been in power for mm-hmm. seven years. He introduces this coin as tribute to the Byzantines. It was refused by Justin II. He is very orthodox in his beliefs. He then goes to war against Abdul Malik and loses and loses. And so as a result of that, uh, Abdul Malik now then introduces this brand new coin. Well, uh, most people have done mm. one of that, this coin. I'll just show it right here. This is the coin we're talking about with the sword. And now he is the lieutenant of God. He is the caliphate of God. He now has taken out the, he becomes the successor of Muhammad. And you kind of did what you did. You kind of showed three different reference points. One is that you mentioned is Muhammad sent from God, the Zubair it kind of takes on. Abdul Malik up the antes and says, no, he is the successor of Muhammad. And then you go and do a very interesting thing. You then show that Abdul Malik then throws off the images and now just puts script in there. And in the script on those coins from 696 on, all the script is attacking the Byzantine, but it's attacking the person of Jesus Christ. It's attacking, and it's very similar to the same inscriptions we have in the Dome of the Rock, which are all confronting his divinity, the Trinity, and his sonship, those three areas. And then he says, I'm going to be the conqueror. So uh, it's me again. It's really putting him. He is not only a messianic figure, but he is now the conqueror of all religions. And this now is now introduced in 696. Then you jump to the, and you show the inscription. You show the uh, the two inscriptions that come after that and the statue that comes later on. But what I thought was fascinating is that you then jump to the Abbasids and you show that the Abbasids have taken it one step further. They now look at it as the successor of the prophet Muhammad. Who is this successor? He is the prophet Muhammad. So they make him into mm-hmm. a person, a man who becomes the prophet because they need a prophetic line. They need to be in that prophetic line. They're not like, they they don't have a prophetic life like the Jews and Christians have. They they want something that they have. They they want what they have, and they also don't have a, a a revelation. And that's why this. If you notice, as the coins are showing this, the books are starting to appear. The Qurans are starting mm-hmm. to appear. The manuscripts are starting to appear about the same period. And in the Abbasid period, then we have a whole proliferation of the manuscripts, many different Qurans. So it stands to reason that the, the coins would then 
parallel, but we're seeing in the manuscript, uh, the evidence. Fascinating stuff. I, 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 coins are great because they don't disintegrate. They don't deteriorate. Mm-hmm. They tell a story and the story they're telling confronts the standard Islamic narrative in almost every point. You have been, you really, uh, and what you've done here, you've shown that the standard Islamic narrative has the wrong people at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, in the wrong languages, and also in many cases, pointing to the wrong, pointing to the wrong ca- characters. And, and that's why it's so good that the coins from that time period redirect that and recorrect it and mm-hmm. also give us a much better narrative, a narrative that was actually happened. And what the narrative that I'm hearing from you is very political and religious simultaneously. It's a political so narrative. Things, things were, were mixed at the time. All the time, yeah. So the two the two were happening simultaneously. And it's a confrontation of the Byzantines, primarily because they're the big superpower of the day. They need to be confronted. So it's confronting the Byzantines, and it's also confronting their theology, which would be, of course, mm-hmm. Orthodox. But there is much more to say on a political level. Um, you see, when Abdul Malik introduced his new coinage, the coinage with the Arabic inscriptions, this was a new pattern for a new empire, because there was a new empire, and, and it was a very original empire. It was an empire made of the Western part, the Byzantine, the formerly Byzantine part, and the Persian part. And here I want to, 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 to pay a homage to Robert Oyland, uh, who wrote it in his book, In God's Pass. Uh, he had a very interesting reflection. Um, he said that um, the Islamic empire was really created by Abdul Malik, and because it was an original empire made from Byzantine, a Byzantine part and a Persian part, it was something that was never swallowed by the Persian influence in, in, um, in, the, in the East, nor by the Byzantine influence in the West. You see, um, for example, um, at the fall of the Roman Empire, in the, um, in the Western world, in Europe, you had, for example, the Franks, the Frankish conqueror who came from Germany and invaded the northern part of France. And they established a kingdom there. It could have been um, a German kingdom. It could have remained so. But it was swallowed by the cultural influence of Rome. Even though Rome was collapsing, was crumbling, the, its influence was still strong enough to absorb, to, to, to take uh, in, into its influence the, the new Frankish kingdom. And so this Frankish kingdom became um, Roman Frankish and will become France thereafter. Mm-hmm. But here in the Middle East, when the Byzantine influence was stronger, the Persian influence was like um, was catching on, and and vice versa. When the Persian influence became stronger, the Byzantine influence um, was still there to 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 prevent the new empire um, from becoming Persian, and so um, an original formula was made which explains why (coughs) Islam uh, endured. Islam could not have endured within uh, an only Persian uh, territory or an only Byzantine territory. It needed those two influences kind of fighting each other to create something new. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, Hoyland explains um, Masterly, masterly, in his book, and it is, um, I think, very, very relevant to explain the um, why Islam began as a religion of an empire, and why it endured because the empire, the empire um, endured. Hmm. Well, this is all stuff for grist. This is stuff for everybody to now listen to. You've now seen. You've seen the whole panoply of what Odon has done with these coins 
from 6.40 all the way up to 7.49 and later. Thanks so much, Adon. I'm sure we're going to get some response from people. We'll be putting this up. Uh, we have a few other videos to put up before I'm this. I'm waiting for it. And when we go and see it, Odon has promised he's waiting for your responses. Mm -hmm. uh, he will respond. And there is, uh, Odon, you have been also collecting Q&As that we need to do some response to the Q&As. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We promised, we promised we would do that and we'll, we'll get mm -hmm. to it. Uh, but bear with us. All, <laughs> all of these uh, episodes were lost. Eight, almost 10 episodes were lost. Uh, in the ether, and we've had to redo this. In some ways, it's much better. I much prefer uh, redoing it. It, it takes time mm -hmm. and effort and energy, I know, and I'm sorry for that, Odun, but you've done a great job of putting these coins in a chronological order. And the graph you've done, folks, take that graph. He's now, you've, saw, you've seen it there. Grab it on your, your, your screenshot and then print it off and then keep it so you can use it to help. Not Download only it from my, well, Download it from my website. Or you can go up to his website and hear his website right here. We'll just put his website here. The great secret of Islam.com. There it is. The great secret of Islam.com is right down right below. Pull it down. You have, he's giving you permission to take down his PowerPoint so that you can use it in your own ministry and in your own discussions and with your own debates. Debate with us. Discuss with us. We want to hear what you have to say in the debate. Comments. Please debate. I, I don't pretend to be right on everything. I think I got the big picture. But debate, debate, correct me. Um, debate can only improve our vision. Yeah. And I'm all for debate. This is called peer review. And we need you as our peers to help us out, to show us where we're wrong or where we're right or where we need to be, we need to improve and where we need to look. Maybe we're missing something. Help us out with this. That's why we're here. That's why you're there. And that's why we can use YouTube as a vehicle to do just that. God bless mm -hmm. you. This has been great. Thanks, Odon, for coming again. And Thank you, Jay. Thank you a lot. Episodes. Uh, this is Odon in France, and this is Jay here in the United States, 3,000 miles apart. Yet, looks like we're right next door, doesn't it? God bless you. We'll see you later, Odon. See you all. This is Jay and Odon, over and out. <laughs>